Hi, I'm Stan Soltair, and I'm here today to uh, put together a, a video that will be basically in two part. That will show um, the ECM motor, uh, it, the operation of the um, uh, instruments that uh, we will that we'll have here to to put this together. But but for, first, in the very first part of this DVD, I'd like to show you the difference and the operations of the ECM motor versus a split capacitor or PSC motor. And we will use those terms ECM for electronically commutated motors or split capacitor motor which would be a, a PSC motor. And to get the, uh, the, the best gist of the ECM motor and its operation, it's probably a good idea to make a comparison between the two and at least most people, uh, our service techs that are in the industry, have dealt with a split capacitor motor. Uh, it is a standard in the industry, has been used for many, many, many years, uh, still being used to this day. However, we're gonna find that as time goes on, the ECM motors are going to start uh, encroaching on split capacitor motors um, and we're not going to see near as many of these motors being used as time goes on. So I do like to use the two to make the comparisons because obviously you, the technicians in the field have worked a lot on these being that it has been the standby for years. Okay, so let's get started here. What happens when you're dealing with a split capacitor or PSC motor? Is lots of times we think in terms of a load that is being put against this motor and that load being what happens when we turn a furnace on or turn the blower on and we are uh, running air through the furnace which is going to have a, usually a coil, air conditioning coil, ductwork on it and in many cases if they are installed in attics or locations where they have to remote the return then we have ductwork on the return side. The other thing that happens is an external part of the air handler or uh, the air mover, in this case a gas furnace, is that you're going to put some type of filtering in. And all of these items that are external of the air mover are going to produce a resistance to airflow, which is the resistance to either one of these motors. In this case, we're talking about the PSC motor. When that occurs, we lots of times think in terms of the fact that this is a load against the motor, and that actually indeed it is. Horsepower at that particular stage of the game is important, so we end up with either quarters or thirds or halves, three quarters, and in some cases with residential applications, we will even have a one horsepower motor. Um, but whatever that application, in this particular case, uh, we'll say that this one has like a third horsepower motor in it. That third horsepower motor with the load that it has against it will produce a given amount of air for the tonnage that we're talking about. Lots of times third horsepower motors is going to be in the in the neighborhood of a three ton application. So we're talking about in that case 1200 CFM of air. The 1200 CFM of air is usually also going to come out in a specification sheet by the manufacturer that says that we will move typically 1200 CFM of air uh, for the three ton application with this third horsepower motor. All right, we've got a duct system on it, uh, return possibly, filters, coils, all of those things are going to create a certain amount of resistance which for this, these purposes we'll call that external static pressure. The external static pressure uh, put against this motor is going to create, for all intentional purposes, the load that that motor has on it. What happens with a split capacitor motor, PSC, is that as we increase that load against that motor, if you want to call it load, then that motor will actually produce less and less CFM at a given static, which manufacturers will typically use 0.5 inches of water column uh, for the, the range that this motor will operate in and up to. Anything past the .5 for most manufacturers pieces of equipment 
we're going to begin to get a deterioration from, in this case, three tons of application, 1200 CFM. That CFM will actually begin to go downhill. We will start to see a loss as we, as we produce more and more static against that, that motor. At 0.7 or 0.8, we're, we're probably nowhere near 1200 CFM uh, at that stage of the game. What happens to the amperage draw, and that's where we're going when we're going to make a comparison to the, to the, uh, uh, the ECM motor, is the PFC uh, motor, split capacitor motor, that uh, amperage draw will take a small or a slight dive. It will go down slightly as we increase the external static pressure. It isn't going to be dramatic, but it will drop off. What does happen though it, that is dramatic is the CFM also begins to deteriorate at that stage of the game. Okay, so we can see that if we're going to put a lot of load against this motor, if we want to call that load, uh, <clears throat> that, that motor is going to produce less and less CFM of air. Where the actual amperage draw goes up on it is when we have less uh, external static pressure. If we're at 0.2 or 0.3, you would see increase, slight increase of amperage draw on this motor right here. It then is beginning to give you more and more CFM of air for the simple reason that we actually in that case are really putting more of a load on the motor. So it's kind of backwards of what we have normally thinking as a technician in the field that the more duct work and if we have filtering systems and we have return air, that actually is increasing the load. Uh, the amperage draw does drop slightly uh, at that particular point when we go above 0.5 and then when we go below 0.5 now we are able to move more air with this motor because it does not have near the resistance to it so the amperage draw goes up slightly on it. It gives us a very very small range for us to operate in and in today's market with the, uh, the government insisting that the SEER ratings of equipment continue to go up. And with the SEER ratings going up, the manufacturers are in a constant battle in trying to uh, produce equipment that will give us a SEER range, uh, SEER is what they call it, that will meet the minimum standards and then of course obviously going above. Today's minimum standard, 13 SEER. Most manufacturers are building equipment in the, even up into the, the 16 SEER uh, in full lines and in lots of cases we have manufacturers that are even going as high as 21, <clears throat> maybe even 22 SEER equipment. To get there and to get those SEER ratings, they are producing uh, the ECM motors. That technology has been around, oh, I'm going to say at least six to seven or eight, maybe eight years now and it is slowly encroaching upon the market that we actually have out here for our, uh, our split capacitor motors. So we're going to see more and more and more of this technology. <clears throat> As we go down the road, we'll see that these will disappear and these will start gaining. They're even using the, uh, the uh, ECM motors for uh, condensing fan motors in higher seared units. So we'll find them in air handlers, we'll find them in gas furnaces, we will find the uh, ECM motors uh, in uh, condensing units. So uh, we're going to have to start looking at w what we need to do to be able to service uh, these motors. Also uh, very important that we find out how uh, we need to, to, uh, to uh, service the units and, and keep them uh, operating properly. The, to make the comparison uh, to the ECM motor now and where it differs from the uh, split capacitor motor. Split capacitor motors obviously are going to have a running capacitor that is, that is hooked in to the uh, electrical running of this motor. You will see here that the, uh, the ECM motor, it is going to have a component that is attached to the back of the motor itself. And the module that is on here is the basic big difference between here and there as far as actually the motor difference. This part of the motor and this motor here are 
in essence somewhat basically the same as far as looks are concerned. You would find many motors in the marketplace that would look exactly like this without the back piece that we have on here which is called the module. The module serves two major functions for the ECM motor. One is that it is going to to deliver not only low voltage but also high voltage to the motor which we're de delivering high voltage to split capacitor motors. You have terminal blocks here that will give you high voltage and low voltage. Low voltage on this side, high voltage on this side here. The module can be removed from the actual base motor itself. This module is going to take voltage that we send to it, whether it be 115 volts or 230 volts. It will take this voltage and convert it to a DC current to the motor itself. The motor is basically a DC motor. Um, and it's a three-phase motor. Okay, the module that's on the back of the CCM motor has a 16-pin connector here that will, will, will receive impulses uh, from your board, which will also get the signals from your thermostat, that will tell it what RPM it needs to run on for that specific application. The, mo the motor is variable speed. However, in this particular case, and for most of the applications that we are dealing with today, we're going to have a motor that will be sent from a thermostat to a board and then to the motor, which will select a specific motor speed that it will run in. Pulse modulation would also be applicable down the road and in the future where this same motor can actually vary its speed up and down based on what is being told uh, by that application. So for our purposes today what we will talk about is the the 16 pin application that goes here that's thermostatically operated through the board that is on the air handler itself. Um, <clears throat> To go back to now and explain what's happening with this motor once we tell it what to do and where it has a super advantage or a much bigger advantage, if you will, over a split capacitor motor is that we can go in a static range that will vary from actually zero all the way up to almost a full inch and in some cases with some manufacturers a full inch of external static pressure. In the process of doing that, uh, we will vary RPM and we will vary amperage draw on the motor. We also reduce the number of motors that we would use from a horsepower standpoint where quarters, thirds, halves, three quarters and one horsepower motors would be used for specific applications. Now these are broke down pretty much into halves, three quarters and in some instances for five ton applications you may find one horsepower motors. That will allow us to operate in the ranges from zero external static pressure all the way up to a full inch of static pressure and the amperage draw will vary with whatever that load is on that motor. So now what we're going to do is go to the ECM motor and say external static pressures are starting off in a 0.3 range and at the 0.3 range uh, our amperage draws on this motor are extremely low, which makes it very, very efficient, which allows the manufacturers uh, to pick up additional um, uh, efficiencies with, uh, with their piece of equipment, strictly through the fact that the motor itself is drawing much lesser amperage draw. However, for us to accomplish that, we do have to stay in the lower ranges of external static pressure, 0.3 to 0.5. Once we pass 0.5, we're still at a point at which we can deliver the required amount of CFM and we'll go back to the 1200 CFM of air and we'll say this motor is delivering 1200 CFM of air. If we are at 0.5, it's delivering 12. If we are at 0.7, it's delivering 1200 CFM of air. All the way up and to a full inch of static, it could still continue to deliver 1200 CFM of air. If we are having filter uh, load up with dirt, 
If we have a somewhat restricted, restrictive duct system, although we do not want to use this motor to overcome external static pressures because of poor duct systems, it's best to have a very free duct system on your, on your unit if possible. However, they will overcome those external static pressures by a greater margin than, than ECM, uh, excuse me, split capacitor motors will. As the statics go up, uh, our amperage draws go up. That's a little vice versa of what we had here. It's the other side of the coin, if you will. So from an efficiency standpoint, if we're in higher static range, the motor becomes less efficient. If we're in lower external static ranges, then the motor is very, very efficient in comparison to any of our split capacitor motors. The off side of anything that we have talked about would be that if you exceed one inch in static, if your static pressures go to that point, you can have a situation where you get into what the manufacturers call huffing. Huffing would be a case where this motor has reached those ranges at which it is no longer uh, able to cope with the situation that it, is, that it has. Typically, external static pressures are way too high, and the motor will actually back off in RPM and then increase its RPM, back off and increase. What that does is give you this whooshing sound or huffing sound, if you will, and that is an indication that you have probably high external static pressures that you need to look at and deal with so that you can uh, overcome that problem that the motor has. They do not always do this, even under high static ranges. Sometimes what these motors will do will actually back off in their CFM delivery and then they stay at that range so you're not really delivering the CFM that is required for the application that you might have. Basic difference between the two motors as, as a review of what we've just gone through is we have a module attached to the back of our motor, our ECM motor, the ECM motor itself is a, is a DC motor. Uh, we're giving it AC supply to the module, DC to the motor itself. 115 to 30 volt applicable, 24 volts signals that will be supplied to the module itself. Split capacitor motor, obviously run capacitor that will be tied into the electrical service, 115 to 30 volt apply, uh, uh, voltage applied only. And we're talking about a motor here that when we add a load to it or we have greater external static pressures, the amperage will drop slightly, but what happens is the curve on the motor will go down dramatically. As we increase above 0.5, then we will see much, much less delivery as far as CFM. Advantage here is that we can go from zero to almost a full inch of external static pressure and maintain the same CFM range but what happens there is amperage draw goes from a lower CF at lower external static pressures to a higher amperage draw at the higher external static pressures. But this is taken care of our industry as far as performance is concerned and we all know that what's happening with us in the industry is we're beginning to get into a lot of air quality situations greater filters uh, efficiencies are being put on them which creates higher external static pressures uh, and coils that are being installed on top of air handlers or, in, or on top of uh, gas furnaces and in air handlers those uh, coils have higher static ranges to them than what they've ever had because of the efficiencies that the manufacturers are forced to go to. Let's uh, go back and look at uh, the actual motor itself and there may be some confusion out there as far as uh, the mentioning of the fact that this is an AC-DC currented motor, uh, three phase and uh, this, the stator in this motor or the winding section of this motor itself uh, is a three phase AC uh, winding itself. Okay, so our module uh, is going to take your 115 to 230 volts and convert it to a DC current and then also take the DC current and convert it to an AC current that is supplied to the motor uh, at a three phase and the sine, what the, the sine wave that we have there determines 
what RPM that motor is going to turn at at that point. Let's cover a little history on ECM motors uh, dating back to somewhere in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. Uh, the original ones, which we don't have one here with us that we can show you, but I can give you a little demonstration as to how those were uh, put together. The motor itself looked basically just exactly like this right here. Uh, the connector itself came from the motor to a module which was not connected to the back of the motor but in a square box form similar to this attached to the inside of the air handler or the furnace. Uh, and then your electronics from your board would come to the square box and then and that version uh, of this motor was a 1.6 version and again it had the uh, module attached inside of the air handler or the furnace and <clears throat> then after that they came out with a, another version that had a box that was attached or a module that was attached to the back of the, the unit but it, in nature or in color it was similar to this color that you see on the back here. It was more of that, that silver type color and it was attached to the, to the back of the motor, very, very similar to this right here, much deeper in nature um, and it served the same function as it does now. However, <clears throat> we now have it attached to the back of the motor and then installed rather than on the inside of the air handler. Everything came together as a, as a one piece component part. Uh, that was a 2.0 uh, in nature series of ECM motor. Then they came out with the 2.3, which is probably the one that is the most predominant now and is this particular model that we are looking at right here where this is plugged in to uh, your module here. The three phase section of the motor is plugged into the module and then attached to the back of the motor itself. You can take older motors and upgrade those older motors with the silver back that is attached to it or a module and you can upgrade those still keeping the same motor, the older motor, with the newer 2.3 module attached to the back of that motor. So there are upgrades to those motors currently as we speak. The next one that we have here is a uh, module that was used predominantly by the carrier uh, corporation on their high-end units. And that module looked identical to this one uh, with a couple of variations. One the same, that stayed the same is here we have line voltage hooked up to this motor. There's, that one was the same. And then we have a 16-pin connector and that is the same as far as the connector, but we're only using four wires in the 16 pin connector to communicate from a thermostat to a special thermostat to the motor itself. And those again were used specifically in the high-end equipment by carrier and you're probably not going to find that in any of the other or many of the other manufacturers pieces of equipment. Okay and the last one uh, has been introduced uh, in the early part of 2007. Uh, looks very much the same still, except with a couple of changes that they have made. We still have uh, line voltage and maybe a larger connector here, uh, but we no longer have a 16 pin, pin connector uh, at this point. We have a 4 pin connector only and a large configuration as well, but still looks very much the same with those two connectors on it. In that particular case, our thermostat is communicating with the board though, and then the board in turn communicates through the four wire connector that goes to the, to the module on the motor itself. And that is the, the, pretty much the extent of the difference between uh, the earliest models of, the, of these all the way through until the current ones that are now coming out. Original models uh, that they came out with uh, the drip legs that they had on those was one of the things that they instantly found out because of moisture. Uh, they had to uh, make sure that the wiring arrangement of these motors was such that when they were installed, either upflow, downflow, horizontal application, 
uh, that the water was tracked away from the motor because there were condensation issues with with the motors. Those issues have pretty much taken a back seat now because of uh, the fact that number one they came up with them and the technology that they currently uh, are using. Uh, they have gotten away from any of the problems that, w that were being incurred with the water situations on those earlier models. Pretty much on the uh, 2.0s uh, we had some of that and then uh, some of those that were before then. The ones that were attached to the to the side here, very little trouble with those. But the water problems have pretty much been uh, resolved. If you are removing a motor and reinstalling it, it is highly recommended that you reinstall the motor back in its original position that the manufacturer has it in there. Don't rotate it around or put it in a different position than what you took it out. If you do, then you could possibly run into any kinds of water problems. The other situation is, Condensation problems don't always develop in here. Sometimes they develop up on top. That water may run down inside the blower, be thrown around inside the housing itself, and any water that actually comes in contact with wiring that is attached to the, to the side of this uh, module needs to be where it tracks away from the module itself. One other thing that we need to make notation of is that uh, that is dramatically different than from a uh, split capacitor motor versus the ECM motors is that on startup the motors will do what uh, is sometimes called hunt or hunting and the motor will actually vibrate and make a small bumping sound where you can actually see the blower wheel if you take the cover off and look inside you'll see the motor actually rotate back and forth. In this particular case, I'm moving the shaft back and forth. Uh, it will take the blower housing and move it back and forth like this. Finding the direction that it needs to, to turn in is what it's doing. And eventually it says, okay, I need to turn in this direction to deliver the air that, that is needed for that particular application. Uh, that is a strange phenomenon that these motors have that you never find in a split capacitor motor. Uh, that, that rotation or s trying to select the direction that it, it needs to go in is not a reason for you to condemn or, or say that we've got a motor problem. Uh, should the, uh, the occasion come up where a end user has made comment that they have not heard this noise before with their older system and that the uh, current unit is making a bumping sound and you, you come as a technician to take a look at it. You've never noticed this situation before where the motor is trying, uh, rocking back and forth from one position to the other. Do not condemn that motor uh, because of that situation. That is a normal phenomena that that motor goes through to try to figure out which way it needs to go. Another thing that we need to know that is uh, characteristic of this motor during a failure, which we will mention when we start talking about modules again later on uh, in the service aspect of this is that in some cases when modules fail technicians will actually take the motor itself and with the module attached and they will turn the shaft and they will find that it doesn't turn as easy as this one turns right now but that you have to take a tremendous amount of of tension or force to actually make the shaft turn and it is a natural thing for technicians to, and I do it all the time, turn the shaft of the motor to see if it turns freely. Well, these are magnetized. You can feel the actual magnet pull when you turn this now. But when this module fails on this end in some uh, applications where the type of failure in the module can cause this shaft to actually get much, much harder to turn, almost to the point to where the analytic part of it will be, oh, we have a bad motor because I cannot turn the shaft. Or I can turn the shaft, but it is very, very difficult. The thinking process there with many technicians is I have either a bad shaft, something inside here has jammed the shaft, or um, I have a bad bearing. That second one is the one that is used the most. And manufacturers have done lots of research on motors that have been returned uh, where they are finding that as many as 40% or higher motors are returned 
saying that we have bad bearings, bad motor, something in this part of it is bad when all we needed to do was to change the module out and that would have resolved the problem because the actual module had failed. So something that you might want to remember that if you're looking at a motor and you're turning the shaft, that does not always mean that you actually have a problem with that. The quick find out for that is to remove the module, unplug the module to where you have nothing but this in hand, and then see if you have release of the shaft itself as far as the tightness of the shaft turning. When you have done that, you have probably just found out that you have a problem really in the module and not within the motor itself. Every ECM motor uh, can be used either on 120 or 240 volts. The arrangement for accepting that voltage will be done through the clip that you have that fastens on to the line voltage side of the motor. If you see a jumper on it like this, that's actually going to be set up for 120 volts. The other arrangement without the jumper on here is going to be for 240 volts. The ranges for 120 volts could be as low as 102 volts through 138 volts. The range for uh, 240 volts could be as low as 204 volts and as high as 276 volts. The modules that are attached to the motor itself, even though the motor is 120 or 240 volts, a specific module to that motor and to its application in either a furnace or an air handler have to be kept correct. In other words, module to motor to, air, to specific air handler. The modules are programmed either by manufacturer of the motor itself or through some manufacturers who have the, the authority and uh, the rights to be able to program the module itself. And so this module is specific to that motor and that combination is specific to either a furnace or a uh, air handler. Also taking from manufacturer to manufacturer even though this manufacturer here might have a motor in it that is a half horsepower motor and the module that they have applied to that air handler that combination may not fit in another manufacturer's air handler will not fit in another manufacturer's air handler and give you the specific CFM ranges that you're looking for. No furnaces are built the same with the same static ranges on them. So the programming is completely different and specific to each manufacturer's uh, piece of equipment. Alright, every ma manufacturer is going to have dip switches of some type like these on this board here and they will be set from the manufacturer for uh, specific speeds. They are typically done in pairs. One pair is going to actually set your, your heating speeds. One pair will typically set your cooling speeds. Okay, third pair is a delay pair. That pair will determine the characteristics of how the motor speeds up and slows down at the beginning of the cycle and at the end of the cycle. The fourth pair uh, will actually be an overall uh, determination as to the speed. It can be adjusted to where we will add to the speed that we currently have set or subtract or take away from the speed. So we could either have more airflow or less airflow by a minor adjustment through the last or fourth pair. Okay, and not all manufacturers will do it the same, nor do they have the same setup as far as the uh, arrangement or the array of dip switches. As you can see here on this one through a uh, manufacturer setup, they are showing a uh, different uh, setup as far as the, the uh, one and two, three and four, and so on switches that they have or dip switch settings that they have in this particular uh, one right here. The, the recommendation is that you use the specific manufacturer's installation and operation uh, so that you can determine how you need to set either speeds, like in this graph right here. This one here is telling us what speed do we need um, as far as CFM. 
and that set of switches there will determine whether we're dealing with a three ton, three and a half, four, or five, um, could be even lower than that, or up, up through to the 2000 CFM of air. And each manufacturer does it slightly different and so you can't explain each and every one through one graphic like this. This would be specific to this manufacturer. Uh, the set of dip switches that we have on the first one that we showed here might be slightly different than this. In looking at all these dip switches settings from different manufacturers, I want to stress that um, when you get a new piece of equipment and you install it, the manufacturer will typically have their dip switch settings for what they would consider uh, the average or the most commonly used uh, dip switch setting for the, that furnace or air handler. You will most likely need to make changes if you're doing a tonnage change. So you should look at the manufacturer's specification sheets to figure out what dip switch settings are needed for that specific application for that air, for that air handler or that uh, uh, furnace. So let me encourage you to move on to the second section where we do diagnostics and service on ECM motors by introducing to you the variable speed zebra.